it anyway, and like people as we go along. So thanks everyone again for for, for joining. Um, so it's been a little while since we've done any of these JavaScript events. Um, hopefully the next one or one in the not so distant future will be actually on site somewhere. So I'm admitting people at the same time. Um, Cause it'd be nice to see um, some of you, those that are London based in person. Um, uh, I'm Billy. Uh, if you don't know or have not met, I'm one of the co-founders of Oliver Bernard. Uh, we're a tech recruitment agency, but we do actually do some good stuff too. Um, mainly the events and the community based uh, work that we do. JavaScript in London is one of um, 15 or 16 different um, events that we do like Agile London and JVM in London and CodeHers in London. I'll put a link actually in the comments so you can have a look at it. Uh, see if you want to attend others or even speak or host. Um, we're always looking um, for volunteers, so um, we'd appreciate that too. Um, I'm not going to say too much. I'll, uh, I'm going to pass you on to Alexander. Just thanks for, uh, to Alexander for speaking. He's been at SAP, what, eight times, I think you said. Uh, one of the senior software engineers. Thanks, obviously, for speaking and for hosting, uh, for Nico at Zap as well, for help organising. Uh, sure, a few of you, sounds like a few of you know Zap. Um, they're on the buses, they're on train stations pretty much everywhere in London, and it sounds like Amsterdam and Paris, I think you said as well. Um, so they're, they're growing a lot, um, and Alexander's going to give us a bit of an overview of their system and some of the work that he's doing. I'll continue to admit people, and I will try and pass on to you Alexander, you can't share your screen at the moment, I assume. I cannot. Let me see where you are more. I'll make you the host, and that should allow us to do that. There we go. My screen, and now I need to make you the host so you can let people in. Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> I'll mute myself as well. Uh... Um... Wasn't it there that we start at uh, 6.30 GMT? No, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock. <laughs> if people join late, because they might have thought it was late uh, with Zap, like I say, well, I'll send them the recording anyway. I'll, say, I'll, I'll pop it across to you tomorrow to, to amend with if we need to. And then, like I say, if people join late, that they can join. Well, yeah, I didn't really say in terms of the intro, but probably about half an hour in terms of the talk. Um, Q&A will do at the end. So if you've got any questions as we go along, uh, stick them in the comments maybe or just save them to the end and then we'll do a, a Q&A for 10 or 15 minutes so we'll only be about 45 minutes in all I think but sorry I'll mute myself again now <laughs> all right then let me start hello everyone welcome to the talk my name is Zal and I'm the principal software engineer and software developers manager in Zap. And no pun intended, Zal was my name long before Zap. And it was spelled this way. Um, the name of the talk is uh, When the Rest is Gone. And I'm going to be talking about the, uh, some best practices we have established in uh, Zap with my help. And uh, the change of the paradigm of the client and server communication uh, that is actually happening right now. Uh, but first, let's make a recap on the ways server and the clients have communicated in web since uh, the inception of web. Uh, some of you may remember uh, the early days of web when each page was loading a static HTML content from the backend. Remember those days? So every time you click, uh, click on any URL, the browser was going to the backend, then the backend was generating a static HTML file uh, with the data embedded in it. So every uh, everything you see on the screen, like all the prices, all the names, they were already in the uh, in the HTML file when the data was sent um, over the wire. And clicking clicking any link, why can't I remove it? Yeah, clicking any link uh, resulted in a whole page reload. So it worked this way: the browser 
versus a web server, which is usually running Apache. Apache is doing HTTP handling and passes the uh, parameters, the query to the server side uh, script, which is was usually PHP or Perl script. That script goes to the database, fetches the data, and generates the HTML page with the data inside and returns this page to the browser. This is how it used to work. Then uh, in about 2000, uh, Flash came out and I was uh, one of the pioneers of Flash. My first job was a uh, uh, Flash developer and animator. Then a few, a few years after, Flex uh, appeared. And what has changed at that uh, time, they allowed separation between uh, application code and uh, data. And one of the pioneers was this to advanced studio. I was so fascinated about uh, their website because it looked like this when others website looked like this. I just want to show you, it doesn't really have anything to do with the talk, but check it out. 2003. So everything is moving and all of these parts were um, loaded separately in a separate um, request to the server and, and the data was encoded in the JSON. No. And of course there was a video and graphics and sound, which was not there in regular HTML and JavaScript. Well, in 2005, they introduced Ajax or Ajax, which allowed uh, allow you to go to the web server and fetch data separately. And where the it's when the things started to change, they looked this way. So browser goes to the web server, web server returns the application. It's either the Swift flash file or the JavaScript file of single page application. And that code runs does one or multiple Ajax requests and uh, that the server goes to the database, the database returns the result and the result is passed to the browser in XML or JSON format. That's what we are used to these days. And Ajax is curr uh, currently more, uh, more often referred as uh, fetch, the regular fetch that you have in uh, TypeScript or JavaScript. Yeah, this is the same diagram in just in a in different style. Um, I don't think I need to uh, list the uh, benefits of this uh, approach versus the, the previous one. The main benefit is that uh, was that now the backend development cycle and the frontend development cycle were completely uh, separated and Backend developers didn't have to know about anything about CSS, and backend and frontend developers didn't have to know about backend and so on and so forth. And of course, there was less data requests because the data persisted on the client even be between the page changes. So lots of benefits. But I know we now first talk about the two ways the data is fetched these days, uh, the two main ways and the, the difference between them, the REST and GraphQL. And I think the, the pictures illustrate quite well what the difference is. The REST, uh, you go and fetch yourself what you need. And with GraphQL, you kind of tell GraphQL what you need and in one request, it returns you uh, everything. Uh, the difference is that REST is simpler it's simpler in terms of uh, using and uh, writing and GraphQL is more complex. We won't talk, uh, we won't go into details. I just want to set the stage for you. Um, things change a little bit when you need the server to client communication. Uh, two main ways to get updates on the client is to 
do polling, either long polling or short polling. Uh, just do request every n seconds or minutes uh, for the new data and the regular REST API can be used for that. Or you have to have a WebSocket server and WebSocket is a technology that allows you once the communication is established and the, communi um, the communication is uh, initiated by the client, the server and the client can send uh, messages back and forth. And this is how it works. So again, the browser goes to the web server, gets an application, then it goes to the API server, API goes to the database, returns the uh, JSON, and whenever something is changed in a database from uh, from from behind or some other client sends uh, sends the message, database triggers a web socket server, and this web socket server either sends the whole data to the browser or just notifies the browser to fetch um, data again. And if you just need to um, notify your client in the application, for example, about the change of the order. Yeah, this is a bit of an overkill to write this sort of stuff. Um, if you think about what, what it means to write a WebSocket server, have anyone written a WebSocket server? No one, all right. Um, this is the uh, example from um, WebSocket library for Node.js. So when you write WebSocket server, you first need to um, have a collection of the clients that have connected to you, then manage the collection of the users, uh, no, so, sorry, subscriptions, clients, subscriptions uh, for each user. And from the other side, you have uh, uh, updates from the database. And for each update, you have to go through all the clients and all their subscription and understand to, we, to which client you need to send this update for. And whenever you, uh, you add the new subscription type, you have to write code. Whenever you uh, add a new some, uh, database record, you need to write code. And the same applies for GraphQL. Uh, subscriptions. GraphQL has also the um, possibility to update uh, the clients whenever data is changed, but it doesn't come for free. You need to write code. And what we have adapted in Zap is what's called um, backend as a service. Uh, there are many, many of those backends as a services, and one of them is the Firebase. It's a collection of services. Um, usually they include authentication, uh, database, uh, file storage, hosting, uh, A-B testing framework. And AWS has one, Google has one, there are lots of them. But uh, the true enabler uh, for us was the uh, Fire store, which is a database inside Firebase. This is the database layer in, inside Firebase. And this basically uh, en encapsulates all of, where is it? All of this. Firestore is a, uh, is a database that has the API, database itself, and the WebSocket server. And it does it in a way that um, you don't have to write, sometimes you don't have to write any code on the backend. The way it works is that um, browsers can directly fetch data from the database and backend work with the very same data as the clients. So it is really enough for the client to get hold of the data if it is already in fire uh, in firestore um, we don't write we don't have apis in in, in that i uh, recently looked at our services and we don't have api we don't we don't have uh, neither 
uh, REST or GraphQL, well, GraphQL we have in some places, but those are legacy. And the new systems, we, we um, write API less. Is it even a term? <laughs> And another enabler is that this WebSocket comes for free. So every browser or every application can just subscribe to changes uh, either on the record or on the collection in this, dat in this database. Yeah, maybe I'm not uh, uh, saying anything new for you, but I just want to uh, show you how big of a deal is that because I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviews and uh js meetup oh js meetup i'm doing a lot of interviews and um candidates they are still stuck in this uh, request response uh, paradigm so when they solve uh, uh puzzles that i give them they design their uh solution in terms of there's a server let's make a rest api and uh, fetch it from the client with uh, with modern day technologies, we don't need to um, write any sort of API, or at least not uh, for data access. Let me show you how it looks like on the client. So this is how you get uh, an order, for example. That's this is the client side code for Firestore, and this set this set order is the yeah, um, React. React hook for, for the state, use state. Um, and there is like nothing to be done on the server side to enable this. You can also um, manipulate the data from the client. You can update, for example, here I update the quantity of an orders. Uh, that should, have, should be not an order, but uh, product, whatever. Uh, updating the... Uh, part of the records in the collection uh, from the client side, no server side code. Here I subscribe to the collection for, I'm getting all the orders that were created uh, before, uh, after the date or before the date. And also updating the uh, hook. So this means whenever data is changed in the database, all the clients will, uh, Quite fast, the latency is like in, in uh, milliseconds, usually depending on the um, on the network conditions. But all the clients will get the updates quite fast, and we also use it for as a signaling mechanism. So whenever you order Zap and you see um, the updates of the rider or updates of the uh, order. Uh, status, it is go it's going through the um, subscriptions to the subscription to the Firestore. Yeah, the same way it goes the subscription to a specific document or record um, with the use of some third party libraries, it, it can be even done more concise. So uh, there is a, this Firebase React library that provides you hooks, which you just give the query and voila. Really, this much of code needed to uh, get the data in your application. Um, and I haven't talked about it yet, uh, Firestore and all of the other uh, solutions that I will talk later about, they have um, a framework to um, for the uh, security rules um, to, for your data. So it means that in a declarative way, you can write who can access your data. And for example, here, um, the warehouse's uh, collection can be only accessed by the, the user with the eStuff user uh, record. And it, this language is quite sophisticated, so you can actually fetch other records. And But the, the beauty of it is it's declarative. So you don't need to write code if, user uh, is tough user then throw error and uh, uh, return 404 or 401 unauthorized. It's done by the database. And here you can compare the backend code and the frontend code. 
it's really the same thing. So the beauty of it is that backend and the frontend uh, libraries has been done. Um, um, I, I have the same API and they're using the same um, value object. Yeah, it may sound that I'm affiliated with uh, with Firestore, uh, but really it's it's it has been uh, a big enabler for for Zap to go fast. And going fast uh, to market was uh, was very critical in that red race. So um, let's go through some real world examples of uh, how our, our applications uh, work. So here is a diagram of the auto creation flow. Um, by the way, each of these uh, um, blocks or uh, ver vertical lines is the uh, Firebase or Google um, project. So they have different Firestore. So th these are all different Firestore, not instances because it's in the cloud, but like namespaces, I guess it's called projects. So um, the consumer app that you might familiar with, be familiar with, um, if you have ever, ever ordered from Zap, uh, makes a cloud function call with an order and that create order function writes this order to the to the Firestore. And the consumer app gets the, uh, is subscribing to this uh, entity in the Firestore and just uh, gets updates from it. And it gets the ID uh, from uh, from uh, the request from this function. So what comes here, uh, backwards goes the ID, then consumer app subscribes to this ID in the Firestore, and whenever any updates uh, come in here, they um, they appear in the app. Also, this uh, cloud function uh, just sends uh, pop sub events to other services. Well, not to other; it's a pop sub, so it fires one uh, pop sub event, and whoever needs it um, fetches it. So regular um, CQRS uh, my microservices thing. Uh, but instead of microservices, there are uh, cloud functions. So one cloud functions in the picker app. The picker is the person who uh, collects the products in the back in the stores. Uh, one of the created function receives the pop up message, just writes it in the Firestore and the picker app who has been uh, subscribed to the orders collection in its own uh, Firestore uh, gets an update. Okay, the new order. So the order needs to be picked. And the regular is also created for the driver. The driver doesn't act on it at the moment. Why? Why, why did it jump? Okay, this one. Uh, here, let's say the picker uh, have collected the, the order. So what the picker does, it doesn't call any cloud function. It only mutates the uh, picked state in the database, in its own database. And this triggers um, a handler. Uh, it's a cloud function. Yeah, okay, the, the, there is a cloud function that uh, is triggered, which sends pop sub events to uh, whoever is interested about this picked change to them. And one of them would be a driver app. Um, this cloud function on order picked is mutating the a state of its own copy of the order with the picked flag. And this means the driver can start uh, delivery. And uh, the similar uh, process goes to the, uh, happens in the consumer, consumer backend uh, that pops up is handled by the function, the function mutates the Firestore uh, record and the consumer gets the update uh, from the Firestore about uh, the, that the order has been, uh, the delivery has, has started. All right, I guess this is all clear. I don't really have feedback because everyone's silent. Uh, I, I switched them, all. Um, all right. Let's go here. So to, to recap, to emphasize, uh, there was very little API 
written only the the business logic to send uh, the send events and uh, store um, data in the database as a result of this event. So we didn't have any uh, API for data access from the our applications. And applications are notified about uh, change of the data without also writing any any code. It's 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 provided. Um, yeah. For example, in in our uh, picker app, the picker can only access uh, orders from its own warehouses. So we uh, we check that in these uh, rules that I uh, talked before, we restrict access to uh, orders from a different warehouse. So this is also handled all handled by um, Firestore without us writing any executable code. It's all in a declarative way written in just one file. And the thing I haven't mentioned yet, uh, it also allows you um, and provides you with transactional safety. So I think I don't have to explain what transaction is, but uh, transactions can be both uh, front end and back end. Though they have different uh, guarantees, um, on front end and back end, but we would not go into details. Um, for uh, for regular cases, they work the same way, same API, and it's really uh, often hard to tell whether you are on the back end or on the front end. A um, few things you need to have in mind when you uh, transition to database as a as an API approach. Um, it really depends who is asking for, uh, for the records. For example, um, we don't want our pickers to be able to fetch uh, consumer sensitive data. So they don't need, they don't uh, know the phone number and the picker app don't, don't even get it through the API. They don't get the phone number, they don't get the um, address and so on. They don't know who, are, who they speak for. And we have customer support who um, have to access to such data. And thus, uh, we have to have two different records that represent the same, uh, the same entity. One is for the picker, one is for the customer support, another one for the rider. This is a bit um, of a mind twist when uh, when you do um, and design data database for um, for this sort of backend as a service uh, applications. Another one, uh, my mind twist uh, doesn't only apply for Firestore or backend as a service. It's a generic problem uh, for key value stores the data has to be denormalized. And denormalized means um, you have to store everything in one, in one place. In case of an order, for example, uh, the product title, the product uh, image, thumbnail um, have to be stored in the order record. So you cannot do joins um, with Firestore. And this uh, means uh, data duplication. So this image uh, URL can be scattered across uh, many different records. Unlike uh, in SQL, you would just join many, many tables and uh, output it in the GraphQL fashion. Doesn't work, doesn't fly with Firestore. Yeah. Um, but you still have to apply a rest, rest like thinking. It just, the mind twist here is that instead of uh, presenting the data in a rest like format, you have to store the data in the rest like format. So rest is not really that, it's just uh, transitioned to, uh, not, not gone, sorry, it was the name of the talk. Uh, it has transitioned to the um, data persistence uh, level. And 
By the way, Firestore and all the others also provide you with the REST-like API. So for, if you're running the, if your application runs somewhere where the um, uh, library is not supported, you can just use plain uh, REST API to these records. And, and it would also apply the data access, data access rules. Right. Yeah, as I said, there are several, several uh, providers and uh, all of big uh, cloud providers has its own backend as a service solution, which in turn in, um, inside of it has uh, something similar to Firestore. So Firebase has a Firestore, AWS Amplify has something. I don't know what's never, I think it's just called database. Superbase uh, has its own solution and all of them have very similar API. All of them uh, provide uh, subscriptions, uh, uh, capabilities, all of them provide REST uh, like API. It just uh, Amplify and Superbase, they use Postgres under the hood. So maybe their joint queries are possible, I don't, really know there must be some limitations on uh, on the performance of that so you might might not be able to do subscriptions to join queries if you know please uh, share your knowledge with me if you have a, you ever used amplify and superbase and that's actually the last slide of my talk and i would love to hear some questions I think we've got a few people. I think I can unmute. I think you can all unmute yourself anyway, can't you? But um, yeah, any any questions at all? I think there was one or two posted in the chat. I think Jody mentioned a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see that, Alexander. Uh, how do I get to the chat? I'm not used to the... Oh, down, here. down at the bottom. And see, yep. Clement said, okay. Uh, presumably it, it only needs to be denormalized in Firebase. Your database can still be relational. Yeah, uh, it is true. So um, behind uh, your Firestore, you, then you, can, uh, you can use any other database, but um, you, there can be a relational database but you would have to um, also have a copy of uh, your data denormalized presented in Firestore. So far we have thought of this solution, but so far um, the capabilities of Firestore were just enough to have uh, all the data just in Firestore. So we didn't bother having um, uh, mm -hmm. Postgres or anything MySQL. Okay. How about latency? Um, latency. Latency is good, though it's not super reliable. With a mobile network, uh, the updates can uh, can go for several seconds, or sometimes up to tens of seconds. But like ninety um, fifth percentile is uh, within a second. I would say, from my experience. Pricing. Um, so if you don't store gigabytes of data and we are only uh, using uh, Firestore to store the current data, so only current uh, orders that are being processed uh, is of interest to us. And once the order is complete, it has, it's never, um, it is never accessed anymore. So we don't, yet have but um, in future we would just wipe all the order uh, all the old orders and uh, we'll have a purgatory for the old orders somewhere in probably a relational database or in uh, um, bi uh, data lake so the, the pricing uh, is not really a concern if you are not uh, doing some sort of like chat applications when uh, every record 
because in Firestore you you pay for every uh, read and write for the record, and uh, when something uh, some subscription gets an update, it's one one read and one write, of course, or multiple reads. But Firestore hasn't been our main uh, uh, source or not source um, main price main cost. The main cost is actually uh, Google Maps API. It is crazy expensive. Uh, how do we debug problems? Um, I at console logs. <laughs> I write tests and uh, do console log. Sorry, I I couldn't figure out how to use the debugger. And I just do console logging. Uh, security. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, ways to do that. All right. Yes, I didn't talk about it. So to enable security, uh, this every uh, backend as a service solution provides also authentication layer. So you are authenticated also through this uh, framework and uh, Firestore is, into, is integrated into Firebase authentication framework. So whenever a user is coming to, um, uh, to Firebase, we know it's uh, email, we know it's ID and uh, we can write, um, Security rules based on that. So, for example, we can have a, a, a collection of users that have access, or collection of users that have uh, admin access, or a collection of users with different uh, uh, flags, admin, manager, and that, that's actually how it works. In in those um, uh, wait, was it here? Here, sorry. Hmm. Here, just uh, parsers. I didn't include include this parsers function, um, but it basically gets the all the properties of this user and returns returns them as a user. Um, the user is just another record in the database. You can combine these uh, records and identify whether this specific user has access to this particular record. And it's per, uh, you can identify security per collection or per record, but we cannot go deeper on the attribute level, which is fine. That's why you have to uh, have duplicates of the data for different sort uh, different user types. And yes, it's using GWT uh, under the hood. The possible authentication methods are endless. I mean, Firebase supports its own authentication. It supports phone authentication, email authentication, password authentication, Facebook, and any OAuth server. You can plug, plug in uh, your Okta, for example. All right. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> Wait. But, uh, yeah, there's just one more, Jody. Although she's had to go, but yeah, I'm trying to understand the question. But I was wondering if you had multiple APIs that browsers are talking to separately, or if you are combining them all in Firebase. Yeah. So uh, every our application has its own backend, so it's its own Firestore or Google uh, project. And it has its own Firebase, it's its own set of cloud functions. And each application has its own copy of the data. So it means the object, uh, the order object is uh, duplicated many times across applications, but in, in every application, only the necessary fields are stored. So the consumer app uh, 
object order contains information about the delivery address and uh, what has been ordered, but the copy of that in um, driver's app doesn't have a list of items. Driver doesn't have to know about what, what is it delivering. It, I think it only have the uh, weight of the whole package, rough eight, uh, weight, mm, that's it. So answering your question, uh, the application is talking to one backend and this backend is sending messages to other backends and those are updating uh, their own firebases. And this is what I am describing here. So actually the main question uh, when you do, um, design system or application with Firebase is whether to use a cloud function or to uh, mutate the data directly in the database. And so far I have not um, found an answer for that. Uh, usually we are just, for data mutations, we are calling cloud functions. But sometimes when it's just a change of a, a property, mutating it directly in the database uh, is it's just simpler. Perfect. I think that's it. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll, as, as I mentioned at start, I'll... Um, so actually, may, may, may I ask the sure. audience if... Uh, have anyone worked with, uh, with Firestore or with uh, any or solutions from, from this list? Looks like no. Or don't, you don't have the microphones or what? I'm not sure. I mean, they. Uh... You used Firebase and Firestore a few years ago. Yeah. Not but give up on it. Give it another try. Um, as, I'm, as I was saying, it has been a huge enabler for us. And we are not thinking of in terms of APIs anymore. We are just thinking in terms of uh, business logic and uh, data uh, data structures. This whole thing of uh, client to server communication is just, we don't care about it. We don't, we don't do it. <laughs> we only write backend logic and frontend logic. And communication layer is magic. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it for the questions. So I'll we'll get a recording out probably early next week. Um, but no, thank you. Thanks for all for attending. Thanks, Alexander, for the talk. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll see you all. We'll see you all soon. All the best. Cheers. Take care, everyone.